Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to First Church and our Women's Fellowship program tonight. Um, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. Um, the bathrooms are out the back door to your right, if you need it. Um, and we're also we're recording this, just, just so you know, so um, for people that can't attend tonight. So my name is Cindy Demur, and I am the co-president along with Diane Remington of the Women's Fellowship here at First Church. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us this evening. We are so happy to have Elizabeth D'Amico here with us tonight. Elizabeth is a psychotherapist who lives in Suffield with her husband Joe, who's also with us. Um, they're here to give us some insight, encouragement, and assurance about understanding and navigating aging and aging parents. Please join me in welcoming Liz. Thank you. Hi, and welcome. It's really nice to see everybody. And I'm really not good at um, managing microphones in addition to everything else. So we'll see how this goes. Um, but I'd really like to thank um, Cindy and Diane Remington and the Women's Fellowship for inviting me to share some information that I hope is helpful. And if people can't hear me, give me signs, so that's, that's um, good to know. Um, before, and I, I want to present a, a, a fair amount of material on different things, and there will be an opportunity at the end if you'd like to ask questions. But what I'd like to start with is when I started my career, which was oh, I don't know, in about 35 or plus years ago. And I was in my late 20s, early 30s, something like that. And I really thought that I could work as a psychotherapist with anybody. And it didn't matter what their issue with, was, it didn't matter what their culture was, it didn't matter religion or ethnicity or race or anything else, and it didn't matter how old they were. And as I, and I, that's the arrogance of youth, it's the arrogance of being a new professional in whatever field. But one of the things that I've figured out as I myself have aged is that it really doesn't work that way. And that I really did not understand what it was like to be older until I actually became older. It's a difference that we don't understand three-dimensionally until we actually get there. But similarly, uh, when you ask someone who is 85 or 90 or 100 or 50 or 55 or 60, how old they feel inside, they say, I feel just the same as I did when I was 20 or 25 or 30. We may not feel the same physically, but we're the same people. And so aging is a complicated, concept and time is a complicated concept. So talking about aging and aging parents and aging partners is a huge topic. It could be a course, it could be an entire degree in college. So I'm going to be doing less than the Reader's Digest version on a number of areas and I hope that you'll um, forgive me for that. But if there are areas that you're interested in learning more about, um, there may be later opportunities that get together again, or I'm happy to work with individuals or families um, individually. So as the flyer suggested, and, and Cindy so kindly introduced me, I am a psychotherapist. Um, I live in town with my husband, Joe, who is also a psychotherapist and I have been in the field for over 35 years. I first started working in child and adolescent psychiatry, and then I started also working with adults and seniors, and for a period of time, I ran a geriatric psychiatry unit in an inpatient hospital. I worked as a clinical administrator for a lot of years, and I've been in private practice with Joe for all of those years. And I recently retired from my full-time administrative position. I'm back to doing full-time private practice, and I teach um, community college and grad school. And that's great. 
that's, that's a really nice change. I see individuals um, as young as eight and as old as 103 um, for therapy, for supportive psychotherapy, both in my home office and I also see people in their own homes if that's more convenient and for many seniors that, that seems to work much better. I also help families with transition planning through the aging process and um, if you'd like to know more about me, I have a website, you can call me, you can ask me, whatever. But this is really not about me, okay? So tonight, um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about parents and aging parents, but almost everything that I'm going to say can also be applied to aging partners, aging siblings, sometimes aging children if they have issues that they need assistance. So it's not just about aging parents. There are two aspects that I'd like to talk about in, in general categories. One is the emotional side of this, and the other is the practical side of it. By practical, I mean dealing with all of the actual decision making, the arrangements for in-home care, the transition to a different living situation, be it moving in with you as the adult child, into a house, from a house to a condo or an apartment, to independent living or assisted living, to subsidize senior housing, to a skilled nursing facility. The medical decisions, the legal decisions, the financial decisions, and so forth. Conversely, by emotional, I'm talking about the dynamics between you and your parent or other loved one. We all have relationships with our parent or parents. Good, not so good, or somewhere in between. But they're always complicated. These lifelong relationships we have with our parents impact how we're approaching the current tasks of trying to assist them. Before going any further, I'd like to make a few comments about what's called temperament. And I left a handout about temperament on the front table. And goodness of fit. Two child psychiatrists who happen to be married, Stella Chess and Alexander Thomas, did a lot of work on uh, child development and a lot of research. And this goes back probably 35, 40 years. And they originated the concept of temperament. We're all born with a temperament. And the temperament encompasses nine different domains. And part of it's about mood, and part of it's about sensitivity, and part of it's about how flexible we are. And it all melds together, and it really explains how we operate in the world. Some children are easy children. Some children are, are a little bit difficult and fussy. There's others that are, are some kind of mixture. Well, parents have a temperament. Our temperaments don't change over time, and temperaments don't necessarily match parent to child. So you may have four children, and they may have entirely different temperaments. So we can love all our children, but we may get along with some better than others, we may mesh with them better than others, and that's called goodness of fit. Well, your goodness of fit with your parent is going to affect how you're going to be able to manage some of the tasks that we're talking about. OK, back to the emotion. So I'd like everyone to think about a particular question that's really the key for what we're talking about. Are adult children supposed to become responsible for their parents? Who says so? This is a social value issue, and some people would respond quickly, of course, of course. Others would say that parents have children, that's their choice, and children do not owe their parents. I asked, um, I asked the 30-something, uh, 20-year-olds that I have in community college this week what they thought, and their answers varied as much as I suspect they would vary among you. And it had a lot to do with 
family culture, family background, religious perspectives in some cases. People often have thoughts in between here somewhere. There's no right or wrong answer, but it's complicated. In your family, is there a family norm regarding what happens when parents age and they need help? Is it assumed that adult children help, or is there actually a discussion at some point when you're growing up about this? When you think about assisting your parents or partner or whomever, Think carefully. Are you doing it because you want to? Or because there's no one else? Or because some visible or invisible entity says that you should? Or because you feel guilty? Or who's going to step up if you don't? Perhaps it's a mixture. But how you think about why you have stepped up or are stepping up has a whole lot to do with how you manage the tasks. Many in the field argue that any emotionally healthy adult will support their parents through the aging process. I'm among those who am not willing to go quite that far. Relationships are complicated, and putting judgments on others and on ourselves about the choices that we make or that others make is problematic. Fifty or so years ago, it was a lot simpler. Seniors just moved in with their children if they didn't already live in the same house or next door or down the block. And typically, they died a lot younger than they do today, or we do today. We have gotten much better at extending life, even if the quality of life can vary tremendously in our later years. Family constellations are also much more complex today. Some families have multiple adult children, children of both parents, half-siblings, step-siblings, and so forth. These relationships complicate things even further. For example, Joe and I have heard people say, I'll take care of mom, but he's your father. You need to deal with him. In addition, siblings often don't agree on helping parents, whether to, how much to do, who does what, and who's in charge. And then there's the money. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Certainly not in all cases, but generally, females feel more responsible to help, believing that helping parents is an obligation, not a choice. If you look around the room, I think that that will uh, play out a little bit, right? <laughs> Males tend to be able to opt out more easily, or at least be more passive in their involvement in helping with parents. This is not a criticism, it's just an observation. It's the way society has, has reinforced the different gender roles. Assuming that you have siblings, because not everybody has siblings, who among the siblings ends up most responsible for managing the myriad areas with which parents need assistance is sometimes about legal decisions that have been made earlier. For example, who has been designated as power of attorney, and so forth. But more often, it seems to be related to who lives closest geographically, and who believes it's an obligation, or simply wants to help their parents. It also, re it also relates to our roles in our family of origin that started in childhood. Who is the overachiever, the clown, the rebellious one, daddy's or mommy's favorite, the organizer, the parentified child, and on and on? Where you fall in the birth order in your family also contributes to your role and how much you feel you need to step up. However, we need to see our siblings as adults as opposed to grown-up versions of their childhood selves. 
And I do have to acknowledge I haven't gotten this one down pat yet. We need to recognize that our siblings and ourselves, we have strengths in areas where we can be more helpful, and there are some areas where we can be less helpful among those who opt in. And there's just things that we're not good at. It's really difficult not reverting to our childhood relational patterns with our siblings in the midst of these kinds of situations. There are also reasons why adult children opt out of responsibility for their parents in parental care. For personality conflicts, to family arguments, to traumatic events in childhood, including abuse of all kinds. While most parents try their best, best, not all parents are good or kind or successful in having positive relationships with their children. It is important to keep this in mind when we are wondering why someone or another is not getting involved with a, pa with a parent's care. Also, personality changes in some aging adults can complicate this further. While natural to be angry or resentful towards siblings who don't help, it's important to try to let go of these feelings. We each get to make our own decision to opt in or opt out. There's no legal obligation to care for another adult, including our relatives. Even as siblings, we don't know everything about our sibling's relationship with our parents, whether recently or in childhood. There's always more to the story than we know. Children are often treated very differently from each other by parents. We have to remind ourselves that we made a choice to get involved or to help, even when we feel that there isn't a choice, since no one else is doing anything. There are also times when children should not be responsible or involved with their parents' care. Just as parents aren't perfect, neither are children. If you are too angry or resentful to your parents or partner or whoever, or just get angry about having to manage this at times, Herculean task, you should reconsider. There is nothing worse for seniors than having their care and well-being managed by someone who resents every minute of it, reasonable or not. One final thought related to this area. Overall, we're living longer than previous generations. One quick aside, actually. Baby boomers are living longer than any other generation. After baby boomers, lifespan is getting shorter. And that was actually happening before COVID. So it, it's kind of an interesting little nuance. However, if you survive to 65, the odds are that you're going to live to at least 85, and likely 90 or 100. Not bad. In 1950, about 8% of the entire US population was over 65. Now it's almost 17%. One in seven Americans is over 70. One in seven is over 70. And one in five people over 65 is what is called an elder orphan. And I don't know how many of you have heard that term. But elder orphans are older individuals who do not have children and do not have other people who are going to care for them. So that's 20% of the population over 65 are facing that, that um, issue. Most people, most of us assume that we get to our 60s or somewhere around them, around there, and we can take a break. We can retire. We can maybe travel. Or we can just have a little more time to enjoy life at a different pace. Children are grown. Financial demands are often slightly less. And hopefully, we can pay a little more attention to ourselves. But no. The gradually increasing or abrupt needs of our parents 
come into the picture. We can potentially spend the next 10 or 20 years assisting our parents in managing their care. Joe and I both have worked and actually do work currently with families with adult children in their 70s who are caring for their parents in their 90s. We used to talk about the sandwich generation. This is a little bit different. You may not be responsible for children any longer, but you have the often more difficult task of assisting parents. And since many people continue to work into their 60s or 70s or even 80s, adult children are trying to balance that care of their parents or partner or loved one with work, plus having some time for themselves. When does your time come? Few of us, when we were 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50, Think about getting older, infirm, or maybe even getting some form of dementia. Again, I asked my students this week, and I said, you know, do you, do you think about, you know, when you're going to get older and, and things are going to happen and you think about dying or where you're going to die? Well, they, don't, they haven't thought about dying yet, apparently, so that wasn't even, they didn't have an answer for that one. And I asked them what they thought seniors were, and they said, oh, 40 or 50. I said, oh, okay. But literally, the average age is like 20. Um, but life happens, and it, life happens to all of us. It comes to some earlier than others, but the physical changes and often illnesses of aging do come to all of us. And sometimes in unkind, abrupt ways. We didn't see that stroke, or heart attack, or cancer, or dementia coming. One comforting statistic that I saw the other day, which made me feel much better, actually, is that 90% of us will live to the end of our lives without any form of dementia. 90%. So it's interesting because we think about all of the people who have dementia, need extreme care, lots of Alzheimer's, uh, Lewy body, vascular, Parkinson's, MS, whatever, but it's really only 10% that have any significant dementia symptoms for any, from any disease process. I'm like, ooh, that's pretty good. Okay, so you've decided you're gonna take on this caretaking role. Whether truly because you want to, or because you feel you should, or whatever. Remember that your lifelong history with your parent will be front and center as you try to negotiate decisions with and for them. Our connections to our parents are hardwired if we grow up with them. Our parents do something or say something and we respond in a predictable manner without thinking about it. We have been dancing with our parents our entire lives. That's what we do in our relationships. But the dance with parents is what actually created our wiring, those neural pathways. So while we can recognize it, we cannot step outside of the dance very easily and be truly objective. So let's talk for a few minutes about the people that we're concerned about. Parents for many of you, partners for others. And let's talk about what it's like to be an older adult in the United States in 2022. First, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty good idea not to panic. Natural aging processes include changes that may make you anxious, but it's simply part of the package. It may be, a, a change that you see may be a parent's changing focus or different approach to things. And it may be that what's going on is it's simply related to their different life stage rather than some other more serious kind of issue. Or it could be something more. Aging can include both physiological 
in cognitive psychological changes as well as the intersection between the two. However, as you know, your parents and all older adults have the right to maintain their role, respect, and maximum decision making. We all need to be aware, we all need to beware, beware rather than aware, we all need to beware of becoming a parent to our parents. And that can be tempting. Ageism is the most common form of discrimination in the United States. And yet, it impacts potentially every single person who gets older. It's not a select population. It's all of us, eventually. Ageism is more common than racism, sexism, discrimination around gender identity, or sexual orientation, religious discrimination, and so forth. We make jokes about seniors and we don't even think about it being a problem. Western society has an obsession with youth. How many of you have been called elder speak terms? Honey, sweetie, darling, sure, all those. As seniors of all ages, we are individuals who want control of our lives, we want to be respected, and to maintain as much independence as possible throughout our lives. The negative impact of aging, ageism is well documented. Stress, depression, a higher risk of heart disease result when seniors internalize those negative messages from the media and the people around us. Older people who feel they are a burden to others see their lives as less valuable, increasing their risk of isolation and depression. Ageism can cause a damaging cycle. Marginalization leads to low self-esteem, which in turn accelerates withdrawal and physical decline. A study from Yale University showed that negative beliefs about aging may be linked to brain changes related to Alzheimer's disease. Specifically, people who had more negative thoughts about aging had a significantly greater number of amyloid plaques and tangles, two conditions that are associated with Alzheimer's. Another Yale study showed that positive attitudes at, about aging, starting when you're younger, can extend your life by seven and a half years. A greater lifespan gain than from having low cholesterol, low blood pressure, maintaining a healthy weight, or even being a non-smoker. So ageism is killing us, is the bottom line. Unless there's clinical evidence to the contrary, we want to assume that seniors want to maintain control of and involvement in the management of their own lives. While adult children may not agree with parents' choices on every turn, everyone has the right to make bad choices, unless it results in an irreparable harm to themselves or others or puts them at extreme risk. Just because you like your way better doesn't mean it is better for your parent. When working with medical or other health professionals or caregivers, the primary conversations should be with the senior, him or herself. If you are the adult child, you may be included and probably should be included. But this is not how many in the medical field behave. Medical professionals often talk about seniors to an adult child while the senior is in the room, as if they don't maintain rights over their own bodies and lives. If a medical professional does this, it's important to ask them to speak to the parent who is the patient. Even if, if someone has moderate or advanced dementia, efforts should be made toward inclusion and maximizing their sense of autonomy. 
I cannot tell you how many seniors have expressed hurt, rage, sadness, and other similar feelings at being ignored, not included, talked about, and minimized. They have managed to live to 80 or 90 or 100, so they must have done something right and deserve continued recognition of their personhood and individual rights. Okay, so how do you get involved with helping your parents in the first place? To start with, there really should be a conversation with your parents about the eventual or possibly current need for care. Some of you may remember the difficult conversations that your parents had with you as a child or adolescent, most commonly about sex, but there may have been other topics that you talked about that were difficult to talk about. Some families do a really good job about it avoiding all of those conversations altogether, but, but most families have some of them. This is gonna be like that. We have trouble having frank discussions intergenerationally about difficult topics. We beat around the bush. We put a verbal toe in the water with a parent or maybe a partner and when there is an angry or defensive reaction, or we are ignored, we give up. We are emotionally triggered. Like when we made our parent angry when we were six or 12 or 16. Parental displeasure cuts all of us to the core emotionally, and we seek to avoid that displeasure at all costs. So how do we get this done? How do we get them the help that they need now or may need soon? The first goal probably is to have your parents recognize that they need some help or they're going to need some help before too long. This goes back to the ideal. When parents, adults, plan for their own, or their own life transitions early on in life. Few do this because nobody wants to think about dying. Nobody wants to think about the changes that we're going to face as we get older. We try to avoid it as long as possible. And some people take no responsibility for their aging or their death. I was very lucky. I had very practical parents who put everything in place in their 50s, wills, durable powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, living wills, everything. Although they had to change them several times as circumstances changed and wishes changed, all the, all the kids knew what was what, who was responsible for what, and could even opt out if we were uncomfortable or unwilling. But few adults do this planning. If you want to do your children or other family members a favor, get materials in order as young as possible. Um, one of the things that, that happens that people don't think about is if you don't put those things um, in place, you can end up having people be making decisions about your life and death kinds of things that you may not have intended to have happen. So um, it can default depending on the laws of the state and how it works. But back to the conversation with your parents. Rather than just coming out and abruptly saying that they need help, you can try offering suggestions or guidance, or that you might be struggling with some of the same things and, and just reflect on it. But if the situation is emergent, you're not gonna be able to do that, and you're going to have to be more direct. Otherwise, it's going to feel like you're being sneaky or misleading. One approach, ideally before a crisis, is to have a family meeting with everybody involved who wants to be involved or wants a voice. Technology gives us an advantage that we didn't have even just a few years ago in that we can do virtual meetings. So anybody who wants to attend 
can do it virtually, um, no matter their distance or their availability. Decide ahead of time who is going to coordinate the meeting whether a family member, or if feelings are running too strong, or people feel they need assistance, it's good to get an objective party to help. These meetings are not kind of the one and done thing, but it's a starting point to talk about the different areas that you're going to need to think about, now or down the line. It's a good time to also consider all of the different paperwork that you may need to get your hands on, financial, legal, wills, and so forth. One of the, um, the handouts that I left on the table is several pages from a book that was put out by AARP a number of years ago, and it has some ideas about family meetings, it has some guidance around the kind of documents that are helpful. There are also a number of organizing, as I call them, organizing books that have been put out. Um, one of them has a title something like, um, I'm dead now, it's not the exact title. But it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a binder basically that allows you to put all of your own information about all your accounts and your last wishes and everything in some kind of organized way. Um, now, I'm assuming that parents want their children to be managing their care, but they may not, and they get to choose otherwise as long as they are of sound mind. Earlier, I alluded, alluded to the fact that not all parents are the greatest parents to their children. They're not perfect. However, the opposite is also true. Not all children are ideal for being responsible for their parents. We actually, um, we actually advise that seniors be very careful about whom they give legal responsibility, whether health care proxy or power of attorney. We have seen too many situations where seniors have lost all of their assets to less than scrupulous children, or they were placed in nursing homes because that was easier for the family not because the senior wanted to be there or there weren't other options. I mean, it, it happens more than, jo, Joe and I have seen it more than, more than we would like to admit. And we never assume that our children are going to do us harm. But it is um, striking how much that this happens. Again, it is not an automatic that children have to be responsible. Lawyers, close trusted friends, whatever, can take the roles of power of attorney, health care proxy, and so on. I want to talk just for a couple minutes about getting support. Similar to raising children, there is no easy off-ramp to the responsibility of caring for loved ones, frankly, until they pass away. Thus, it's so important to find ways to get support, take breaks, and get reality testing at those times when you may be the target of criticism or resentment from your family, from your siblings, from your parents, whoever. Assisting others can be an almost thankless task, and it competes with all the other responsibilities that you have as well as the many things you would like to do. Doing even small things that you enjoy can have a huge impact. I left another uh, list on the table of just some simple things to um, think about just to take a break. It's not like you have to you know, fly to Paris. Um, taking a walk, taking a yoga class, singing, whatever. Support can come from family at times, Friends who are in a similar situation, religious or spiritual venues, support groups, or psychotherapy. Supportive therapy can be a useful tool for having a place to let off steam, process myriad emotions, get reality testing, and also get at ideas about how to deal with specific situations. Psychotherapy is useful for the caregiver 
as well as the care receiver, depending on the situation. Taking care of parents or partners or loved ones, or even preparing to, can be a very sad process. We are facing the reality and the finality of death, theirs and our own. Just sorting out a parent's or a partner's or a loved one's belongings, selling them, dividing them, giving them away, can be an enormous task, literally and emotionally. Okay, so we have a bit of time left and I wanna shift to talk just for a couple minutes about the practical side of the equation. Perhaps the biggest challenge that we have is managing where your loved one is going to live. Although most of us want to die at home, the majority of us will die in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility. Not ideal. They are exorbitantly expensive and generally much, much better and preferable care can be obtained in other ways. Certainly, there are situations where nursing home care cannot be avoided. But most people can remain in a home situation with the right supports. Government funding rules have changed in the past 20 years. And the whole idea of money follows the person concept has helped many more seniors remain at home. But it takes a lot of effort and um, assistance to manage this. It's most difficult to manage someone at home who has moderate or advanced dementia. There are many times when that's actually pretty impossible. Skilled nursing facilities have a role, but they are not places that anyone wants to live or end their lives. No matter how good the facility, they are depressing, isolating, generally understaffed, and sadly, places of abuse and neglect. Please don't believe because one particular facility has nicer furniture or lovelier decorations than others that they're better facilities. It's just not the case. There are thousands of people in nursing homes who do not need to be there, but have been placed there because there doesn't seem to be another option, or family doesn't know the options, or they are told that it's the right thing to do. Trust me, from the person's perspective who's placed in the nursing home, it is never the right thing to do. This is an area where our society needs to figure out how to do it better. Joe did psychiatric consulting in skilled nursing facilities for over 20 years. Um, and as a result, he wrote a book about the realities of what life is like for those living in nursing homes. We're not promoting the book, that isn't the point. But you may have some interest in reading it just for another perspective on this world. We're going to leave a copy of the book with the Women's Fellowship here at the church. So if people want to borrow it, from, from here, they're welcome to. And it's also available pretty inexpensively at Barnes and & Noble. And we're also happy to lend copies to folks if you're interested. A few quick comments about finances. Some people have the assets or the insurance plans to provide much of the required care that somebody may need, in-home or otherwise. Others have protected their assets and or have low enough income that they're eligible for a variety of government-funded services. However, many seniors fall somewhere in between, and they have to spend down their assets or use income to pay for services. There are many programs available, and much of the work is in identifying the services that are needed and what one may be eligible for. Elder law attorneys, geriatric case managers, social service agencies, and others can be helpful with this. There's a lot to know. It can be pretty overwhelming. And it can be a challenge to sort out the nuances of care and paying for care. 
So many decisions have to do with legal and financial issues. And thus, it's really important to get guidance into this. It's really complicated. Another area that I want to mention is that we often have to, that we often have to deal with related to um, parents or loved ones is the need to stop driving. This is a huge loss for people. Can you imagine not being able to drive? Family members are loath to take on the challenge of taking away the keys, often allowing people to drive far longer than they're safe to do so. We tend to minimize how bad their driving is. We also assume that somebody else is going to step in, like physicians, and take away those keys. Trust me. Unless the family tells the doctor to do something, the doctor is not going to do something. They're not going to take the necessary steps. And sometimes not even then. My father had advancing dementia, and we eventually learned that his driving was in name only. My mother, not wanting him to lose his last area of independence, would direct him from the passenger seat including telling him when to break. This had gotten worse gradually, and so they thought nothing of it. The loss of being told that he could not drive was huge for both of them. Finally, a recommendation for all of you regarding medical professionals. As I said, ageism is alive and well, and it's alive and well in the medical profession. There are many doctors who treat you differently if your biological number is beyond a certain point. If they say you are doing well for your age, that is ageism. In other words, they stop looking for interventions but assume that the way you are the way you are because you are old. This is ageism, again. I'm not arguing for extraordinary measures for people who have myriad chronic or progressive illnesses for which there are no real interventions. If this is, however, if this is your medical professional who's behaving this way, I would consider changing them or get another opinion about whatever the issue is that you're facing. Also, I just want to mention that depression is epidemic among seniors in this country. It's actually epidemic right now among all ages in this country. But it has gotten much worse due to COVID, and it was very serious with seniors before that. This is due to loneliness, loss, isolation, physical deterioration, chronic pain, loss of purpose, fear of dying, and so forth. Seniors' rates of suicide are second only to that of young people. And generally, we don't even know that they have died of suicide because we don't question the death. Older people die. Suicide is much easier for seniors because of their access to pills. So please pay attention to depression among your loved ones of all ages and yourself. Life can be very hard, and we all need support and assistance. And I just, um, uh, I just in, in ending before we do some questions, I want to share a poem by Mary Oliver, who is one of my husband and my very favorite poets. She's a New England, she was a New England poet. She's passed away um, and a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. But this is called, When Death Comes. When death comes, like a hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measles pox, when death comes 
like an iceberg between the shoulder blades. I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness. And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an, an idea. And I consider eternity another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it is over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Mary Oliver, When Death Comes. Okay, thank you. So, questions, comments, reactions? Okay. Oh, okay. You have to hold on So, taking the driver's license or telling my mom that she's no longer able to drive was not even an issue. It, I mean, it was just, it was done. Um, the biggest hurdle is her living alone. Of the generation that we lived in this house for 55, 56 years, uh, my dad has passed, my brother has passed. It is me. And I bought a house big, bigger after my brother died to accompany my mom and dad to come live with me, to take care of them. But she refuses. I have concerns about her living alone, forgetful, um, safety, loneliness, everything. And she just wants to be there. We looked at, you know, talk about independent living, come living with us. Driver's license, I thought that was going to be an issue. That was a no brand. This one, I cannot get past. What do you do? <laughs> so it's, it's a little hard to answer specifically when I don't know beyond a certain point, but I can, I can give you some of the things that happen. It has a lot to do with um, the person's safety, capacity, risk factors and whatever. One of the things about, um, that tends to be the case as we get older and, old, and, and the earlier generations is that there are a certain group of professionals that are seen as the authorities. So sometimes if a doctor or a lawyer that they trust says, um, guess what? this isn't safe anymore, I'm worried about you, you need to have somebody living with you. I had a, a family that I was working with recently that was a similar kind of situation where there was no way they should have been living alone. Well, what eventually happened, what, similar to what you're talking about with your mom, what happened was there was in a medical event and the doctor ordered some in-home services, physical therapy, nursing, whatever. They came in and they promptly made a report to Protective Services. Protective Services came in and said, essentially, either you get someone in the home or they go to a nursing home. And they have the authority to take over and make that happen if family or whoever 
um, has the responsibility doesn't act. So there are, and, and I, trust me, I am not big on having protective services come into your life, but there are natural consequences that eventually happen um, when, when people are too unsafe. Um, I'm not big on threatening, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, but sometimes you can get in sideways and, and convince, um, convince people, and again, often you know, with authorities. So. Can you talk a little bit about um, people with significant mental health issues? in a younger as adults who then age. Uh, is there a particular mental health that we're like saying bipolar, schizophrenia, you know, so something you've been dealing with an, with an adult parent most of your life. And then they're aging. Um, well, I, I used to work for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, so uh, for a period of time. Um, it really is a huge challenge because for, for lots of reasons. Um, part of it is because um, it's much harder to maintain sort of a stable mental status or, or, or um, because the medications don't work in the same way. Um, there's, there, there's, so, there's so many pieces to what you're asking, I guess. I mean, I, I think um, you're talking about an already complex issue. Depending on how accepting they are of services, that's, an, that's another piece to it. Um, depending on who's responsible for their services, but yeah, um, I think I'd need, I think I'd need it narrowed a little bit to be too helpful. Um, it used to be not, not about 30 years ago in the state of Connecticut, most people with major mental illnesses who were in any way unstable lived in nursing homes from the time they were 30 on, and then we did deinstitutionalization and got people out, um, but. It's similar to any kind of cognitive issue that somebody has. If somebody has a Down syndrome or cognitive impairment or any other kind of issue, aging complicates it, the aging process. So I'm not sure that was helpful, but um, probably, probably individually I could answer it a little bit better. But. Sure, absolutely, absolutely, sure. And the question she had was having a parent who has a major mental illness, yeah. bipolar, schizophrenia, major depressive, whatever, who are then aging, how do you manage that? Very difficult, very difficult. And the other thing is, 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 a, is there a dementia process that's coming in on top of it? Um, often the case. So, and sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's a dementia process or is it the mental illness. I mean, it's, right. So then who does she see? Who does she take her parent to see to evaluate? So it, so it, it depends on lots of things. Most, many people who have a major mental illness have treaters that they've been with a psychiatrist who's doing medication, um, or there may be a therapist that they're working with. You can have lots of people screen people. I do screenings of, of folks. But when it gets into the complexities of that, you know, is it a disease process? Is it the mental illness? Is it stroke? Is it what? You really need an MD. One of the things I worry a little bit about, and, I, and I've heard actually several times in the past couple of weeks, is there an aw there's an awful lot of general practitioners who are terrific general practitioners, I'm sure, who don't um, refer out to people who are seniors and have particular needs. 
anybody who's got stroke possibility, anyone who has signs of dementia, anyone who has any kind of geriatric issue should be seeing a neurologist or a geriatric specialist. And uh, I, I'm just concerned that it gets back to the ageism issue. Well, you're old, da 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 it, It's a specialty. They need different care. Um, and in some cases, it may be a neurologist and a psychiatrist if it's, if it's a situation like that. Um, just like we go to a urologist if we have that kind of issue. So. I think that's a really important point that you're making. Loss is one of the biggest reasons that people feel desperate. I, I see um, someone who is about 87, and she probably had a, she had a huge network, and she is literally the last person alive. Someone ends up last, right? Um, and then when you can't get out or you can't see them, I mean, again, COVID didn't help, but. I'm not saying it's not normative, absolutely. I mean, it's, it makes sense. Um, but it's difficult, and I can't tell you how many people in just this town alone, every town, don't have people that visit them, don't ever see anybody. And that's whether they're living in their own home or they're living in a nursing home. It, so we tend to be a much more isolative society than we used to be, and, and that's just not helping. But thank you, I appreciate that. Any last words? Okay. I just wanted to share, I had to go through um, a lot of what you talked about with my mother, who's bipolar, has dementia, the whole thing moving and it was um, about a two and a half year process um, brother not helpful wonderful husband thankful but anyway Suffield Community Aid um, was a huge help um, to listen to be resourceful um, and they had some they had the contact numbers and they helped explain the difference between Medicare and Medicaid and QMB and you know all kinds of different things. Um, they had ideas for housing. They had ideas for food. Um, they, they, they also helped me refocus. My mother was living alone and shouldn't have been, you know. But um, you know, it's a safety issue, is what it came down to. And um, so, whether you live in Southfield or another town, please consider your resource there in the community. Thank you. Jewel of the uh, of the town, and it's really unusual. And, and Joe and I have worked with an awful lot of different social service agencies. Um, but you know, Janet Fajet obviously was retiring, but Pat Beeman and Beth Sheridan, they're amazing in what they can do with just a very small force. They actually have helped out folks from other towns too. I shouldn't say that out loud, but. Um, they, they've just been tremendously gracious and um, very helpful. So, they, absolutely, thank you. So. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much again for coming. I so appreciate you listening. And again, one of the things is 
I'm talking about generalities. It doesn't fit everybody, everything perfectly, but if there's anything I can do um, beyond tonight, just let me know. And take good care.